Welcome to Follow Him, a weekly podcast dedicated to helping individuals and families with their Come Follow Me study. I'm Hank Smith. And I'm John, by the way. We love to learn. We love to laugh. We want to learn and laugh with you. As together, we follow Him. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Follow Him. My name is Hank Smith. I'm your host, and I am here with my (laughs) patriarch-like co-host, John, by the way. John, we're talking about the patriarchs today, (laughs) Adam and Noah and Enoch. And I thought, that's John. You would fit right in with those with those awesome patriarchs. Oh, thank you, I think. Yes. No, you would. You would. (laughs) (laughs) Now, I'm not I'm not saying you're old because you're not old. Oh, no, it didn't didn't come across like that at all. (laughs) You're you're very patriarch like. (laughs) Now, John, when I looked at the Come Follow Me manual and saw that this was uh, that this lesson is is quite is very focused on teach these things to your children. Yeah. I was thinking, hey, I know a, an expert in parenting and teaching children. Who's with us today? Yes, and she's back, uh, Janet Erickson. Are really glad to have her back, and she talked about uh, when we had the proclamation to the world on the family. Isn't that right, Hank? And was a wonderful, uh, wonderful time. So we're glad to have her back. Uh, Janet is an associate professor of, in the Department of Church History and Doctrine in BYU Religious Education. She teaches the Eternal Family course as well as Introduction to Family Process for the School of Family Life. And her research is focused on material and child well-being in the context of work and family life, as well as the distinct contributions of mothers and fathers in children's development. You chose well today, Hank, for this, uh, this, these particular um, chapters. She's a research fellow of both the Wheatley Institution and the Institute for Family Studies, has been a columnist on family issues for the Deseret News since 2013. I've seen a lot of those articles, and I'm just excited to have her back. Do you know, because I always feel like, Hank, th- these are really practical things. All of us are trying to figure out how to be the kind of family the Lord wants us to be in. So I'm so glad we have Janet back with us today because the, the, get your notes ready because we can maybe get some things that can help us be better moms and dads and children and aunts and uncles and grandparents and patriarchs even. Hey, welcome, Janet. We're excited to have you here. So good to be here. Thank you, John. Thank you, yeah. Hank. We it's, it's just a treat to have you. And I feel like if if anyone listening hasn't gone and listen to our episode with with Janet. Um, go back, just hit pause on this episode. Go back and listen to uh, our the the two we did with her on the proclamation uh, on the family. Uh, go back and listen to those because this will give us probably a really good setup for what we're going to do. What we're going to do today. I'm I'm guessing that a lot of that could could help. You know, set you up in a in a good way to to maybe understand these episodes better. So, uh, Janet, we're in Genesis and Moses uh, today. Genesis five, Moses mm-hmm. six. It's so interesting that Genesis five. I think what it illustrates for us is we needed the prophet Joseph to receive more to help us know the true history of that great prophet Enoch in terms of patterns of families. So. I'm going to just focus on my intent was focus on Moses six. And we can start right at the beginning of Moses six with recognizing that Genesis five provides historical genealogy for us to follow. But, but Moses six really gives us the story, the history. I I was noticing that as well, that you, you you look at Genesis five and you're like, Oh, okay. I get, I get the ancestry. And then I go to Moses six and I get an explosion of of information. (laughs) insight to these that I, I didn't have, uh, that I didn't have before. The title for come follow me, Hank, as you noted already is teach these things freely unto your children. And I think just having that title tells us how significant this chapter is. What is it? The Lord is telling us to teach something to our children, to create a home that is centered around certain things. And what are those things? And if you picked one chapter out of all of scripture, this is the chapter that delineates the core truths that parents would care to teach to their children. And it starts with verse one. And Adam hearkened unto the voice of God and called upon his sons to repent. And I just had to stop there because that word repent is such a challenging word. And yet it's what 
It's what Adam is told by the Lord to do. What does it mean to call upon children to repent? And I think repentance is so difficult because of all the things Satan would want to distort, it would be sin and repentance and atonement and salvation. All those things bound together. That is what he would care most deeply about distorting. And so repentance is so often something we fear. We avoid, right? Our idea is to avoid repentance, do everything you can to avoid needing to repent and prove your righteousness by not needing to repent and fear and shame around that word. And then we have president Nelson kind of break open that distortion and help us understand what repentance is. And when we understand it, then we can see why is it the Lord would say, call upon your children to repent. What does that mean? It's interesting. Um, I've loved the Givens. Uh, they're all things new Fiona and Terrell Givens book. And one of the things that they do is kind of tackle the historical understanding of repentance, especially from the reformation and that it is different than what the original Greek truths about repentance were. So for example, we have this feudalistic period where to sin is to offend God, to offend his honor. That's how we come to understand sin. And then you go to legalism a little later where the idea is God demands a payment for violation of the law. So you have Calvin saying Jesus by his sacrifice appeased divine anger. And Luther saying, God hath laid upon our, our sins, not upon us, but upon his son, Christ Tyndale saying, we need Christ to save us from the vengeance of the law, his blood, his death appease the wrath of God. And so we develop this idea of repentance that is, that is uh, right. That punishment and meeting out a punishment and that, that it's the penalty paid to obtain pardon. So as a child, I remember when we lived in Mexico city, um, seeing people on their hands and knees kind of crawling into the cathedral and trying to understand what was happening. And my dad explaining to us, they're, they're paying penance for their sins. It's the way that they, that they feel they will become free of sin and their understanding of Christ and repentance and sin and salvation was all locked up in this penance idea. But of course we know the Greek word for repentance is metanoeo. President Nelson recently taught us that. And, and what it means is this change of mind, knowledge, spirit, and heart, even breath. Thomas McConkie will say it means coming out of my small mind. And so when Jesus asks us to repent, it is all about growth, a change of mind and heart and becoming not penalty, <laughs> right? It isn't about paying penance. It's about coming out of growing beyond learning, developing, even healing. Hank, you've talked about what he teaches us, how he breaks out of these falsehoods that we have. Um, you'll teach your students, but you just think of the woman caught in adultery and here she's brought before the savior and the accusers are intent on retributive justice, right? This is their idea. And he's going to punish her for her sins. So you have Adam Miller explaining so well what the, the problem of human experience is, how we relate to the law. And we see in the Pharisees this distortion in how they relate to the law. Do we use the law to treat the law as a guide in the work of love? Or do we use it as a means for judging ourselves and what we do or don't deserve or judging what other people do or don't deserve? That whole idea is trapped in this false notion of what repentance really means. And so you'll see, right, even as human beings, how we'll say, look, they're the people that don't keep the law. They're the losers. They're the people that do keep the law, right? And I want to be one of those who does keep the laws because that makes me a winner that we spend time evaluating and measuring personal righteousness. That's all a distortion of what repentance means. It's that idea of I've got to keep right the black marks. I wipe them off, right? And that's what the whole purpose of repentance is. And I want to be as free of as many black marks as I can. When in fact, God is saying, come to me, come to me and grow. And there's this distance to grow, to become holy as they are. This is difficult because I know that parenting is one of the most intimate parts of our lives, right? Our, is uh, the way we parent. Uh, and so we don't want anybody to come away from this going, 
I'm a bad parent or I'm a bad person, right? But it does seem to me that if you get this wrong, if you get a distorted view, if you pass on a distorted view to your children, you'll, in my experience, you end up with resentment instead of repentance. Mm, yeah. It's interesting, Hank, that, that I love how you're saying that. I think so our parenting begins with our own experience of God, our own relationship with ourselves. And we inherit distortions around repentance. And I think that's why this is so beautiful that this chapter starts with teaching us the truth about what repentance means so that we as parents begin by healing our own relationship with that word and which is healing our relationship with ourselves and healing our relationship with God. Because don't you think we as parents, you said it right. It is the most vulnerable thing in the world to be a parent. It is the place where we are most vulnerable to feeling judged, right? Like a good parent and this is the product and a bad parent and you keeping the law. Here we are again, right? If you're keeping the law, this is what it will look like. And if you're not keeping the law, this is what it will look like. And I think this whole truth about repentance turns that totally upside down. It's what is my relationship with the beautiful truths of repentance for me personally? And how do I live that with my children? What's so interesting is when we are in that mode of understanding God and our parenting and all of that, it's why we can be saddled with pain and shame and self-doubt and unworthiness and fear and judgment. And the Lord is not that God. And so the Lord of Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ turns that distortion on his head. And so you see the woman coming to him. They're looking for him to give retribute, right? This justice, this penalty, right? And he says, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. And we see that he is all about change and conversion and healing. He is not about discipline. He's, he's right. He's the God who in third Nephi says, oh, all ye, will ye not now return unto me and repent of your sins and be converted that I may heal you. His entire ministry is one of healing. And, and he interchangeably uses healing with forgiveness of sins. They're used interchangeably. They're coming and saying, we asked you to, we asked you to heal this person sick of the palsy. And you said forgiveness of sins. That's what you have offered and teaching us that, that is what this is and how much we as parents need that deep assurance of the Lord's walking beside us in this journey of parenting, healing us, covering us. Because the whole thing is about growth, development, becoming whole. That whole telios, right? Perfection is completion. It's why it's so much more than paying a debt. The, the Bible dictionary entry on repentance sounds so different than what you might expect. It, it calls it a fresh view about God, about oneself, and about the world. That sounds so different than... Then what you were talking about, Janet, some of those traditional definitions of a, a kind of a scolding tone or, or mindset or punishment, retribution, you called it. I mean, I feel like sometimes in the New Testament, the apostles, hey, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? You know, there's got to be a reason that this guy had this affliction to show us the cause and effect. And, and that was just a mindset back then. So I'm glad you said, President Nelson, say it again. Met, met, I remember that talk, Metaneo. Metanoeo. Metanoeo. Yes. And he talks about that. He, it's like he's quoting the Bible dictionary, a new view, yeah. a fresh view, a new mind, even a new way of breathing. And, and that, that is what repentance really is. A new way it's of why I breathing. Love that. That's <laughs> a new way of breathing, you even right? Breathe Taking differently in. when you get it. <laughs> yes, yes. So I think when Brad Wilcox, you know, he talks about, we believe in being not saved by grace alone, but changed by grace. That this is, this is so, this is a not being saved in our sins, but saved from our sins by having been changed by his love and grace so that that sin is no longer part of us. And what a glorious path. So the truth is we had to leave our heavenly parents. And I think this is what this chapter is about. We had to leave our, the presence of our heavenly parents so that we could experience oppositional choices. So we could taste the bitter to learn to prize the sweetness of what is good and pure. 
that is sin. That bitter, that bitterness is sin or weakness or transgression. And we taste it so that we can know the sweetness that is Christ. And so repentance is the process by which we grow. We return into that healing light. We work with Christ and he in us changing our mind and our hearts and way of being. I think I'm hearing you say is Adam was able to to teach this so well because of his relationship with God. Yes. Right. Yes. Adam knew God really well. They were good friends. And so he was able to teach repentance effectively. So as a parent, if I want to teach repentance effectively, I need to have my own relationship with repentance and with God. Yes. Is that yes. In fact, the, the most transformative thing I think in parenting understanding is we have moved from an understanding of parenting as a role to a relationship. And so you have this powerful parenting pyramid. It's the Arbinger Institute creates this parenting pyramid that I think captures so much. And if you'll just picture it, here's this pyramid at the base of it. The largest section is the relationship I have with myself, with God, my way of being, my my at one moment in a sense with myself and with God. And the next layer up is relationship with spouse. The next layer, layer up is relationship with child. Then it's teaching. And the very top is discipline. And as parents, we tend to spend, where do we spend most of our time? At the top. Discipline. <laughs> Discipline. Correction, right? Like, don't you? And I know this from myself. It's so natural to be like, what are you doing? And correcting. And, and here that pyramid is saying the foundation is my understanding of my relationship with God, with myself, that healed relationship, that relationship that then impacts how I relate to my spouse, that then re impacts how I relate to this child and then how I'm teaching them. And then the correction is so small a portion because that foundation is built upon relationship. And it begins with that relationship with myself. And I think when we see Christ as our advocate, and I mean, in our parenting, in our personal life, in our personal way, not an advocate in that he takes the beating for us, but the advocate in our growth who literally that word in Luke, when he in agony, it's this word that captures the meaning of contest, right? He, he, it was this contest against the powers of evil and bondage in our behalf. And so he literally works in us today at this moment, overcoming that, overcoming the shame, overcoming the fear, overcoming the weakness, overcoming the predisposition that would harm us, the predisposition to sin. And he heals that beautiful relationship as our advocate. And we bring that relationship into our relationship with our children. I know that there are people listening right now who are towards the end of their parenting or even, you know, they have only adult children who are listening and feeling a sense of, oh, no, I did it all wrong. What would you say to someone? I would say right now, don't turn this off. <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't, don't, don't run and hide here. Um, it's okay. It's okay. Right. That It's okay. Just keep listening. You've seen, you've said before it, it, we're in this process as well. You, you weren't supposed to know it all in the beginning. What was I 20 something when I became a parent? <laughs> yeah. Right? right. So the Lord, I think knew I wasn't going to do it perfectly. So, so what would you say to someone who's, who feels a little bit, you know, they're here at the end going, Oh, I taught repentance all wrong. Great. Oh, so I just think here I am, right? 11 years into being mother. I don't know. How, I can't even count the number of nights that I have awakened and thought, why am I like this as a mother? Why do I treat them this way? Why am I in this relationship? And I, whether it's my mom, who's way down the road with great grandchildren now, every single one of us depend on that beautiful assurance that Christ is our advocate right now wherever that is. And his healing is retroactive. I know that whenever I heal in my relationship with him and with myself, it blesses my children. It doesn't matter when that happens, that healing power is felt. And to absolutely know every single, the process, there's no other way for us to learn this, right? This then to live it 
and make mistakes. That's what the whole thing is all about. We taste the bitterness of how we relate and we prize the sweetness of Christ. That was the whole reason we came. We have this idea of perfectionism somehow. I want to do the right thing for my child. I want to make the right decisions. I want to do it right. I want to have it so that they won't have to suffer. And, and you know, that all the questions, am I expecting too much? Am I expecting too little? Do I, too many rules, too, not enough rules. Did I teach them all wrong about repentance? Did I teach them all wrong about covenants? Right? What, what was I doing? And perfectionism, that whole focus on behaviorism and perfectionism. I love how Jennifer Finlayson Fife just totally teaches this so powerfully, but it interferes with intimacy that interferes with our relationships with ourselves and our children. And we, the moment we can be honest about our fallibility, because that is the absolute truth. Instead of hiding behind a false idea that there is some perfect way that we either should have been or should be, then we have blocked intimacy. And it's that intimacy that is the core of parenting. And our children trust us. They, they can track our fallibility better than anybody. They see our hypocrisy better than anybody, right? Like we are unmasked to them. And the moment we are unafraid because we know Christ is our advocate to be fallible to them, honest about that with them, they can trust us. And we have given them the greatest gift, which is to be confident in their own fallibility with Christ as their advocate. So it's just, that is the journey. And the moment we can turn and say, I have failed you because I am a fallible person and he is my redeemer and he is yours. Then we've entered into a space of, of that level of intimacy, right? That is the healing part of parenting. I remember thinking this about my dad before he died. I th he would be so great with my kids so fun with them. And they just adored him. And, and I'm like, that's not my dad. <laughs> that is not the <laughs> same guy that raised me. And I remember saying that to him, you're super nice to them. And, and I don't know how nice you were to us. And he said, yeah, I, I probably was too, too harsh. I probably was too harsh. I'm, and he would say, I'm sorry about that. And, I, and that wasn't the point. I was just saying, you just seem like you've really softened up. Yes. And, Grown, uh, he, right? Grown right. in that security of the assurance of Christ's work. That's why being a grandparent sounds so fun. Is you can, you've, <laughs> no. learned, you've learned so much now. Now you can, yeah, now you can be the parent you wanted to be. <laughs> it takes so much compassion with ourselves, right? Like, and the thing is, compassion with ourselves and compassion with our children is where the power lies. It's that compassion in our own failings, compassion with ourselves about that, right? And, and compassion with them. I, um, I love this statement from William Cotts in the book, Winter's Grace. He says, to avoid shame, and I think this happens so much in parenting, you better believe there's going to be all kinds of anxiety and shame around parenting. We feel responsible for their salvation, that what they do and what they are reflects on us. If I'm righteous, you're going to look and act a certain way. And if I do this right and I control this outcome, and I think when we totally throw that out, when this is about us developing an intimate relationship together, this parent with child, knowing you, loving you, truly loving you. My anxiety is not infecting that relationship, but out of that relationship, right? And working towards that. Then we, then we come to the purpose of parenting that with repentance of the heart, it's this love of repentance, right? It's this gratitude for change. This it's, that's what parenting needs so much, right? And an acceptance of that fallibility for you and for me and, and a gratitude for that beautiful process of the promise of change. Anyways, he, he just says to avoid shame, one must feign perfection, even though the entire enterprise is a joke. <laughs> that is the truth about par parenting, right? Authentic intimacy requires a different way of living. The masks come off and the walls fall down. Whenever honesty is followed by tenderness and mercy without such a love, we are all broken beyond repair. Parents and children, we tear that mask off. I need Christ. You need Christ. I am fallible. You are fallible. You are loved. I am loved. And his work is to help us grow and become. And that's what Adam starts with right here. 
and you have articulated it today, but I feel like modeling repentance for our kids, uh, those have been some tender moments for me when I can sit and as we approach family prayer or whatever and say, you guys, I lost it today and I'm sorry that I... I need help, you know, it just, and those are tender moments when they can see, I I haven't got this figured out either. And uh, more than once with my kids, I hope this is true. I've said, you guys, this isn't you against me or those who make messes against those who clean up the mess. This, this is all of us against the adversary. John, I, I loved how you brought up this is against the adversary. I, I've been thinking there's some beautiful insights. I think Michael Wilcox talks about this, but just being in the temple, you see Satan. The very first thing he wants to do is to shame us in our mortality, shame us in our weakness, shame us, our emotions and our hormones and our traditions and our genetic predispositions that, that are part of our mortality. And so he says, hide and they make a covering, right? They make a covering Adam and Eve do, and it's pathetic. And the savior says, let me offer you a covering. That's what the whole garment represents, right? Is this covering. And it's not a covering because he's ashamed of our mortality. It, I think that word covering so beautifully is to, to fill the holes, to make strong again, to, to heal it, to make it whole. And it's not, he's not ashamed of our mortality. He says, bring it to me. I will fill it. I will cover it. I will, I will make it whole. I will pure. And when we can be that way with our children, it's the only honest and true way to live. Right. And it allows them to have confidence in us, trust in us and trust in Christ. If my parents can rely on him, I can rely on him. If we can do that together, unafraid of the adversary's efforts to shame us as a family, then we are on the path to the Lord's healing power. Well, it's like you said, it, they're the experts on our, my kids. Sins know, and weaknesses. I mean, right? yeah, my kids come to, to hear me do a fireside. They're, they're listening with completely different ears than every other teenager in the room. <laughs> totally. They're like, yeah, right, dad. You know, cause they, they know. And, uh, and that's a, that's always humbling to have, uh, my kids. Yeah. Hear what I say. Don't watch me too close. I think I heard Stephen Covey say once, yeah, I'm teaching you some true things, but don't watch me too close. I'm, I'm still trying to live up to what I, what I believe as well. And I'm still, I'm still trying. (laughs) So I like what you said that they're, they're the, what did you, how did you put it? They are the experts on our, um, our our foibles, our, our fallibility. fallibility. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're the experts on it. And so you can't fake it with them. <laughs> you can't fake it. And we're not supposed to. I think we, that is where the distortion around repentance comes, right? It's a hiding. It's a hiding to one another as other parents. It's hiding to our children. It's hiding, right? And the Lord is saying, take the covering off. Let me cover you. Do not be ashamed of this. That's what the whole thing is about. In fact, Janet, I'm glad you said that because uh, this idea of, of garments and kafar and the covering, one of the things I find fascinating is at a Liberty Jail, when we undertake to cover our sins, instead of having the Savior cover them, uh, th- that's the problem where we think we can cover as a, no, we, we can't do that. We need the Savior to cover. And then I think it's Alma 34, without that we are exposed, he uses the phrase, Yes. Jacob too, right? Says we will stand before God in our nakedness. In a sense, that's how we are in front of our children, right? Yeah. They know our fallibility. So (laughs) I love that you brought that up. They tried to cover themselves. Eh, This, no, I've got something (laughs) so much better. Yeah. Better. Yeah. (laughs) Jenna, as you were talking about being open and honest, I read verse two and it seems that Adam could have a lot of shame or Adam and Eve about what happened with Cain and Abel, but he seems quite, he glorified the name of God. And he said, God appointed me another seed. He's talking about Seth instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. He's very open and honest about (laughs) what happened. It's not like, Oh, we don't talk about that. We don't talk about that moment in our family. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, so true. Hank right there for the entire world. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yeah. He's like this, this happened. This happened in our family. And he's saying, right. 
agency is real. Cain made choices. Agency is a real thing not to hide from. And it means that there's possibility of change is what it means. It's a glorious truth, but, and that all families have real challenges, significant challenges, every family, because that was the whole point of it to learn and grow. It's interesting that we'll talk about in family life, structure and heart, meaning when I ask my students, so what are your goals for your future family? I just read this beautiful paper and he said, I want most important thing for me is to have my children develop faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And they were asked how they're going to do that. What do you think a student's going to say? Scripture study every day, right. family, family home evening, right? Yeah. Family prayer. And those are the structural pieces and they matter. They're important. They're why we're taught to do them. They're the rituals that enable connection. They're what Bill, Will, Bill uh, Doherty, my professor at University of Minnesota, powerful therapist, he would say that the intentional family, and we need intentionality in family life. That's kind of a buzzword, right? To be intentional about where you're going and what you're doing. The intentional family is a ritualizing family. And the gospel of Jesus Christ gives us all these beautiful rituals. That's the word we would use in social science, right? It gives us family scripture study and family prayer and family home evening and, and going to church together and doing all the family councils and family vacations and right. All of these beautiful rituals, those are structural pieces. But as we all know, it's the heart that has to come through in the structure. You could do the structure and not have the heart and impede the heart. Right. And so there's that, just that really important focus. I think when we get the core, right, this repentance and vulnerability and honesty and the savior's redeeming power, and he is our advocate. And there is no shame in our mortality. When we get that, you are fallible. I am fallible. You are loved. I am loved. Then when we do the structure, then that heart will come through. The, and that's not to say, we'll talk about that. It's not to say it's going to be any different than Elder Bednar says when they're sitting down for family devotional and the kids are like, you're quit breathing, you're breathing my, my air, right? You're breathing my air. <laughs> <laughs> yes, totally. <laughs> and the, and the conflict and the contention, it's why Elder Wilford Anderson, right? When he talks about learning the, the music, we learn the dance steps, but we need to hear the music of the gospel. And he'll say, right. That is something we practice over and over again. We're practicing getting the heart there this Christ centered dependence on the Lord, every single one of us together. So I love that you brought up there's Adam unafraid to say, these are the hard things in our family, <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> and so when I'm talking about repentance, that's what I'm talking about. It's that like, if we have that core, right, we're not, we get rid of the fear and shame to one another and to our children. Like we see this as a beautiful experience of growth and it's not to be a hidden, right? But I think we struggle in our culture a lot with that. And parents can feel so much shame, right? About just mortality and which is what the adversary would want us yeah. to feel. We have, I, I just, when I think of how the Book of Mormon starts and that family and how many problems that family had, I thought, are people noticing this? Please notice this was not a perfect family and let, and let's kill dad. No, let's kill Nephi. Oh, I'm sorry. Ishmael died. Let's kill dad and Nephi. Um, a boy like Nephi comes from the same family that a boy like Laman and Lemuel. I, I hope we're saying, look, everybody has an interesting uh, past. And, and if, if, if your kids all turn out great, great. Uh, can you take all the credit? Probably not. Can you take all the blame? Probably not. You know, <laughs> right. Nor can you measure the good that comes from some of those intense struggles, right? That seem so shameful, but that can often put us on a trajectory for growth that we would never trade what happens because of that, right? How we come to know the savior, how we come to really, really know him and feel experience brokenness and his healing. What were we taught by this horrible event we went through? And yes. Would we yes. trade what we were taught now? Yes. Because we, yes. It, it pushed us into the savior in a way we might not have. And then social media doesn't help when you're portraying this, <laughs> this perfect family. That's a very natural thing to do for all of us to kind of hide, to kind of pretend. Here's President Nelson. Nothing is more liberating, more ennobling, or more crucial to our individual progression than is a regular daily focus on repentance. And he's talking about our personal lives and in our family lives. Repentance is not an event. 
It is a process. It is the key to happiness and peace of mind. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a gospel of repentance. That is not a self-flogging punishment kind of orientation, right? He's saying the gospel provides an invitation to keep growing, changing, becoming more pure. It is a gospel of hope, of healing, and of progress. Thus, the gospel is a message of joy. And when we can see repentance, like to take seriously, repentance is the message of joy. When we can we can just take that so seriously. Then we, I think are protected the heart of parenting. This is about change growth, not hiding. Here's verse three. And we see, I'm just going to put verse three and verse four together where it talks about, right? Seth, um, this son of Adam and Eve. And then it says, and then began these men to call upon the name of the Lord and the Lord blessed them. So we're going to learn in this chapter all about how the Lord teaches repentance to his children, like what that looks like. And the very first thing he says, first of all, is he's teaching us repentance is good. This is the gospel of joy, but then call upon the name of the Lord. So elder Christofferson says this divine love, most recently, this divine love should give us abundant comfort and confidence as we pray to the father in the name of Christ. We need not hesitate to call upon God. Even when we feel unworthy, we can rely on the mercy and merits of Jesus Christ to be heard. As we abide in God's love, we depend less and less on the approval of others to guide us. So when we're talking about shame, right? That's this need to be approved of by others, like to be affirmed, right? To feel like other people think we're okay and I'm okay. And, and here Elder Christofferson is saying this beautiful instruction about calling upon the Lord means we can depend less and less on the approval to other of others to guide us and depend on the absolute assurance of his love abiding in his love. So there's that first key to teaching repentance. We can call upon God right now in our sins with our weaknesses and be heard. And he becomes the source of our approval in a sense. I, I think that uh, one of the things that the adversary would want to do is tell us you, you, I love the way you were just saying that uh, you can call upon God in the midst of your problems, not well, as soon as I solve this, then maybe I can approach God about it. Or I can't talk to God right now. I'm, I messed up so badly, which is exactly the best time to talk to him. Um, and so I think about the sequence of come unto Christ and be perfected in him. It's not be perfected and then you'll be able to come unto Christ. The other day we had a difficult experience in my own with my children and my husband and something painful that happened. And, and we had, we had these two children and I, and I could hear in their voices, this is shameful, right? That this question, do we have to be the kind of family that has these kinds of things, right? And they're young. They have yet experience to get with how, right, pervasive these and ordinary these challenges are. But I, but it was so beautiful to have my husband say, we can pray right now mm. for healing from the Lord. And we don't have to be ashamed about this or afraid of it. He is, he beckons us to come right this minute. So I, I love how these verses start with that. Thank you, John, for that beautiful insight. There's a, there's a little saying I heard when I was probably a teenager that I've always loved. And that is Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon her knees or upon his knees. Uh, that's exactly what he does not want you to do is get on your knees uh, but the Lord does want, and you're not going to surprise him. You're not going to say, I did this. You did what? Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he, <laughs> he knows. When my relationship with the Lord is right, I'm, I'm no longer maybe hungering and thirsting, thirsting after that acceptance, right? From other people. And I, re I remember specifically a childhood memory. I remember once the police were called to our house. I was maybe three or four years old. There was a, a domestic issue going on. And they sent, uh, they sent us the, the younger kids out to sit on the curb. I remember the officer said, you guys go sit out here on the curb and I'm going to go talk to, uh, you know, the adults inside. And I remember sitting there and watching all the neighbors come out and they opened their front door to see 
what's going on over, you know, over there at the Smith's house. And I remember that feeling of being seen, like totally exposed to this. Our problems were now very public. And I remember that feeling. I, I couldn't have been more than, than three years old. But I remember that, that shame of this is now open to everyone. Uh, and what you're saying, I think in verse four is if you can somehow stop worrying what anybody else, the neighbors, the ward, <laughs> what anybody else thinks, uh, and go to the Lord in all honesty, when you have that connection with him, these problems become, they're not fun by any means, but they're not shameful. It's yes. just being human. And Hank, that to give a child that is such a gift, right? To know you do not need to be afraid of this mortal life experiences with Christ as your advocate always and forever. And they don't have to hide, right? They can develop confidence in the reality of this fallible mortal experience. We can accept it together. We don't want to like, right. As a three-year-old, even, I think it's so natural to resist, right. The realities of the fallibility of mortality and to feel ashamed about it. But what a gift to give them. I, and, and Janet, just one more plug for the word you're using. I, it's my favorite nickname of the savior is advocate. He's, he's not on the side of the law. He's on our side and our advocate for, for what we're going through is it, if we get that mindset, it changes everything <laughs> that our advocate is by our side our advocate. Uh, so John, keep just, using that just, word. I am, I'm so glad we stopped with that word because the, the Greek word, and I just learned this from a wonderful Is woman. Para, Sage Williams. Paracletos or something? Yes. Yes. And it means consoler as well as advocate. So you get this and then if we think about, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but the Holy Ghost is the, the comforter, right? The consoler. And he is also the teacher of truth. So here, Hank, in this moment as a child, you're being exposed to the truth and comforted at the same time, right? That's what this advocate does. It's not to hide from the truth, but this consoler with us advocating for our growth and testifying of the truth. It's just so powerful, that word advocate. So thank you for stopping us there. Okay, here's verse five. And a book of remembrance was kept. And we're going to read this book of remem remembrance repeatedly. We're going to read the word repentance eight times. We're going to read book of remembrance four or five times. And in which was recorded in the language of Adam, for it was given unto as many as called upon God to write by the spirit of inspiration. I had a really powerful experience as a young, um, single adult. I wasn't young enough. I, I yearned for children and I had a very sacred experience listening to president Iring tell a story. I was in graduate school yearning to be married and have children. I'm listening to his talk in my car and he tells a story about how he taught when he was president of Rick's college, he taught religion and he taught the doctrine and covenants and, and he would tell the students that one of the requirements was to write. And he describes this girl in, in the class who kind of said, why, why do I need to work on these? You know, he could hear her questioning. Why is it so important that I refine my writing skills? And she said something like, the only thing I'm going to write are letters to my children. Probably she didn't see herself, you know, as an academic or something like that. And so why do I need this? And he kind of said, I was kind of, you know, I don't know how to answer this exactly. And this young man stood up in the back of the room and he said, he said, this young man had said very little during the class. I'm not sure he'd ever spoken before. He was older than the other students and shy. He asked if he could speak. He told in a quiet voice of having been a soldier in Vietnam. One day in what he thought would be a lull, he had left his rifle and walked across his compound to mail call to pick up the mail. Just as he got a letter in his hand, he heard a bugle blowing and shouts and mortar and rifle fire coming ahead of the swarming enemy. He fought his way back to his rifle, using his hands as weapons. With the men who survived, he drove the enemy out. The wounded were evacuated. Then he sat down among the living and some of the dead and opened his letter. It was from his mother. She wrote, 
that she had had a spiritual experience that assured her he would live to come home if he were righteous. In my class, the boy said quietly, this phrase I cherish, that letter was scripture to me. I kept it. Now, when the Lord is asking us to write and telling us, here's this example of this mother writing revelation given to her that is scripture for her children. When I think of the most precious things I have for my parents, it's moments just a month ago, mom had a spiritual experience in a very difficult situation, had an answer to prayer come to her. She sent an email to us the next morning. I will ever keep that. It was an answer to her prayers that came from the Lord. Nothing is more scripture than that. And here the Lord is teaching us this beautiful pattern. Parents, write your stories of repentance, right? Write your stories of repentance of the Lord hearing your cry and answering your prayers and helping you and giving you strength. And, and it began there with Adam and Eve writing scripture. When I was younger, I wrote more because I struggled more, right? If you read my journals, you'd think I was just constantly struggling because that's, <laughs> when, I would, that's when I would write is when I was, when I was struggling. Uh, but I've never thought about, you know, sharing that writing with my children, but maybe, you know, maybe it's time to go, go back, look at that writing and say, here's something that may will, will bless my teenagers. Uh, and that'd be very vulnerable though. I'll be honest. <laughs> that would be a very vulnerable move. Yes. They're like, dad, what was going on? Like, oh, <laughs> you don't want to know. Yeah. President Irene kind of changed my life about, about writing in a journal because, you know, I'd figure journals, uh, Oh, I went on this trip. Oh, I, I won this prize. Your daily activities, yeah. whatever. <laughs> and, uh, and here's the price of gasoline or, so, you know, um, and President Eyring, I, I don't, I won't remember the exact phrase, but it was kind of document the hand of God in your life. That's why you're writing a journal. And that's what it will bless your children. And just what you're saying, Janet, repentance, um, spiritual experiences, scripture, uh, impressions, document the hand of God in your life. And I've, you've heard me talk about this before, but my dad on a yellow pad, I think, wrote what is now about 90 pages. My sister-in-law typed it up, an autobiography, his World War II experiences, his conversion, a treasure absolutely priceless uh, treasure because he wrote it down and the, the the parts that are treasure are documenting that God was watching over my life and and helped me and my family and difficult through the depression through World War II everything and so I love that they're being told I mean I, I, I just underlined in verse 6 taught to read and write and I'm thinking about first Nephi chapter 1 verse 1 Therefore, I was taught in the learning of my father I, I, and uh, others, others in the Book of Mormon start out. Yeah, my father and my parents taught me to write mm. how important write that is. by their scriptures, their written testimonies. Right. That's how they were taught to read and write. It's interesting too, right? that it says having a language which was pure and undefiled. And I think as we were talking about in the beginning, it was so illustrative to me to study that history of how we understand the word repentance and the defiling of its meaning, right? And that these, these words that we pass around, that we use, right? And assume, right? Where we can pass distortion right along with them. Uh, we, we need that pure and undefiled truth. And I think that when the Lord teaches us through our hearts by the power of the Holy Ghost, it is pure and undefiled. What we learn is pure and undefiled truth. And when we write that, then it is language that is pure and undefiled. On to verse seven. Now this same priesthood. Okay. So we've learned this pattern of starting with repentance, calling upon the name of the Lord, that this is scripture. And that this book of remembrance that is the, the hand of God in our lives. And then we get this reminder. Now this same priesthood, which was in the beginning, shall be in the end of the world also. And you had Barb Gardner on here talking about this, the truth about priesthood. And here, here we're brought again to this familial patriarchal order of the priesthood. 
which we all enter into as we receive the ordinances of the temple before we're even married. We're initiated in that initiatory ordinance into this familial order of the priesthood, culminating in parents being sealed at an altar together, endowed both of them with priesthood power. So it's, he's saying, this is this familial order of the priesthood by which this book of remembrance, the stories of repentance, the truth about Christ is kept. I, um, I loved the clarification of Elder Renland about what priesthood is. For me, it was so powerful. Do you remember him talking about the rocket and the payload? And you have the rocket. Its whole purpose is to deliver the payload. And so he described the rocket as priesthood, the payload being the atonement of Jesus Christ. And so here, the purpose of the priesthood is to launch, here's his words, to launch and deliver the opportunity to benefit from Christ's atoning power. If you think of being endowed with priesthood power as parents, it's so touching to me to think what I am endowed with is the power to launch the blessings of the atonement of Jesus Christ to my children's lives. I can't make them receive that. That's the beautiful gift of agency, but I can create a space where they experience the truth of it in my life, his, his covenant atoning power in my life and come to see it, its fruits in my life. And, and so here that being endowed with priesthood power, being endowed with the opportunity to launch, right, to carry that atoning power into the lives of our families to facilitate the delivery of the atonement into our children's lives. And if we understand repentance, if we try to, if we're unafraid, if we seek that vulnerability, if we seek to be exposed in honesty and receive his power, that's what we're doing. We're accessing priesthood power to help them experience the atonement in their lives. I love elder Renlund's clarification. Anytime, anytime we are using the priesthood, it is with that purpose in, in mind, deliver the atoning power of Jesus Christ into the lives of other people. John, I remember you telling me that your mom would often tell you guys not to judge your dad, right? He would, cause he would, he would maybe not be the most, I don't even know how you describe him. Uh, maybe not use the, the best words. He used Navy words sometimes. Yeah. And they, they, they <laughs> I, 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 I'm going to face my dad again. So I got to be careful because he, they, they were, they were mild, but he, um, he joined the church at age 24. And, uh, my mom was great because she would say, look, you be careful. You don't know where he came from. And it was kind of, these are my words. Now he had a different starting line. You know, and you don't know where he came from. You be careful. Now you can't use that word. <laughs> yeah, you don't get to use that word. <laughs> yeah, but I think Janet, that's another instance of all of us are in this together. And my mom yeah. saying, "Look, Dad's in this together with us, and he's working on it too. And uh, be careful, because he's trying so hard." And we saw that uh, to this day, I'll find an old book of my dad's and find a note inside to himself, encouraging himself to try harder and to be better. And uh, it was never I've arrived, you know, yeah. it was we're all we're all in this together. Sorry. So, so yeah. beautiful. Thanks, Hank, for bringing that up. So beautiful. Well, it just seems like that, that was your mom trying to yeah. show you the access to the atonement that everybody in this family has. Yeah. And, you know, mom's Miss Pioneer Stock probably walked personally with a handcart, but never mentioned it. I mean, that's that's my mom. And and uh, and she's saying, look, he came from a different place. So so be careful. He's trying so hard. And and he was. And it made me love both of them in in moments like that. You know, and love the Savior to say he's working with all of us. <laughs> yes, he's he's working out our salvation, mm -hmm. all of us. And isn't it interesting as parents, you'll think I'm going to work out their salvation. And about four years in, you're all of a sudden you're like, wait a minute, they're working out my salvation. This was all about me <laughs> learning, right? And this brought, That's what's going on here. So beautiful. Well, verse eight is the other core truth. So we've had this repentance theme. 
this recording that recording repentance in our lives for our children. And then you get to verse eight and the Lord is going to do that most magnificent thing of establishing his relationship with us, of saying, telling us who we are, whose we are, our identity, our, our purpose. So here's verse eight, right? A genealogy was kept of the children of God. These are not just children of this parent and this parent. These are the children of God and the book of generations tying us back. That's why genealogy is so beautiful. It takes us right back to God, the father, God, the mother as, as our parents. And then in verse nine, in the image of his own body, male and female, which tells us heavenly parents created, he them and blessed them and called their name, Adam. Here they are, these direct, this direct lineage of God. Do you remember when President Nelson, there's another general authority who spoke about being in a training session with then Elder Nelson, president of the Quorum of the Twelve. And the question was asked, how do we help these individuals st struggling with pornography? It was recognized that this is a ubiquitous challenge. What do we do? And his profound answer, it was simple. It came right away teach them their identity and their purpose. If you think about this powerful, who you are telling, telling this person, and because this is who you are, there's that beautiful statement of, of president Packer. You are a child of God. He is the father of your spirit. Spiritually, you are of noble birth, the offspring of the king of heaven. Fix that truth in your mind and hold to it. However many generations in your mortal ancestry, no matter what race or people you represent, the pedigree of your spirit can be written on a single line. You are a child of God. And hear the restoration when Joseph sees them, Joseph, my son, it just turns all the blackness of the apostasy upside down right? That whole idea that this is a God with no feeling, with no body parts or passions. He can't be affected by our human suffering. You were created out of nothing. And there's such a distance between you and God that it's un unsurpassable, right? You can't know him. And here your nature is so totally corrupted. All you can hope for is a rescue. This is what Christians believed. And then to be told you are my child, literally. This distance is not only surpassable, it's the whole intent of the whole plan is for you to come and become as I am and how that just knowing parental love, right? How do the, how do we feel when children, you know, disobey, you know, it's not an anger. Um, it's an anger for the hurt that they suffer because of it. It's not an anger because of retribution of this dishonoring of us. Sometimes we have to work out of the, some of those feelings, right? But, but, but this divine love that is grounded in parenthood, in literal parenthood, you are me, you are the other of me. And, and here the Lord just establishing right at the beginning, I want you to know who you are as we talk about repentance and this plan of salvation. So Jenna, what I'm hearing verses eight and nine is if I have a child who's struggling with something, don't, don't shame them for that problem and noble them by teaching them who they are and their yes. purpose. Yes. Um, that lift them out instead of, you know, kind of the natural thing might be to say that's evil stuff. That's, you know, you, you're involved in something terrible. Yes. Which Hank, because when they are, we feel shame. I, isn't that the whole irony, right? It's like, uh, we're so caught up in how they are a reflection of us. So when we, you know, working on the issue of pornography, if, if, if a parent learns that their child's struggling with pornography, the shame that comes with that, right? So the shame for the child and the shame for what kind of a parent has a child who's struggling with this, right? And, and all the shame around shaming our mortality and shaming our mortal experience. And instead of what you're saying, which is if I cannot infect this dynamic with my own insecurity as a parent right? If, if this isn't about me and what's reflecting on me, but it's about you and my love for you and my desire to help you grow and my care, not because you're not because in your choice, not to serve a mission, it's about me or your struggle with this. It's about me, but it's because of what it means for you. How can I help you? 
then we're in a place of power to really see and help them, right? Because it's not infecting it. That's Jennifer Finlayson, five swords. I get, I infect my relationship all the time with my own insecurities about how their behaviors or their choices reflect on me. And that has so much to do with right. My own, my own relationship with God. That's why it comes back to that foundational part of the pyramid is me at peace with my relationship with God and his advocacy for me. And then I relate to my children from that place. And I'm going to go back again and again to healing that as I'm relating to them in their journey with the bitterness of sin and weakness so that I can truly be a help and a guide to them. And that's a lot of weight to put on a child. If it, if they not only have to live their life, they're trying to live yours now as well, because you're putting, you know, you're reflecting me to the rest of the world. So there's a lot of pressure. I think every single parent, right, is experiencing you are a reflection of me. And, and so working on overcoming that so that we can really truly see them and help them sort out the path of truth for their life, right? That's the foundation, them sorting out, not choosing it because of pleasing me, not choosing it out of defiance against me, right? Like I'm going to set my own path, but choosing out of truth to the best that is in, in them. I think there's quite a bit of family data that would say there's power in an identity, right? Like I belong to this family and I live up to that. I so you'll hear parents, right? Remember who you are when you leave the house. <laughs> Remember you're this, right? right? Mm -hmm. And I think at some point, every single one of us know that identity is not enough, right? It is an identity bound in God. I, a child of God as the mother, you, a child of God as the child. And that identity is the only absolutely secure and true identity, right? And so that's what the Lord, he does that right here. It's so beautiful. We say, remember who you are and don't let that get you down. Right? That's what we say. <laughs> I think I love it. I love it. <laughs> My wife uh, tells a story about one of her friends, I guess, growing up, because they, they always heard their parents say to the other siblings, remember who you are when they left. And they didn't, but they didn't know the meaning. What They didn't know what they, their parents meant by that. <laughs> what does that mean? So one time when <laughs> my wife's friend's siblings were leaving, the, the other younger kids yelled, don't forget your name. Because <laughs> that's what they what, thought it my, meant. What mom and dad mean is don't forget, don't forget your, your name. Because, you know, it. kids are always going out there forgetting their names. So they're nervous <laughs> remember who you it, are. Yeah. Don't forget your name. <laughs> <laughs> now we're going to get in these next verses in verse 10, 11, 12, 13. We're getting this beautiful genealogy. And then we get at the end of 13, another phrase we're going to get repeatedly. So it's not unlike this book of remembrance. It's not under, not unlike this identity grounded in God. Here's this next one taught his son Enos in the ways of God. That what, That's what that means to be taught. A couple more times, right? Yes. It's going to happen repeatedly. What does it mean to be taught in the ways of God? And I think that gets back to that whole idea of structure and heart and it, and it is really powerful, the research on family life and the power of what we would call routines and rituals. So routines are th the things you do to keep family functioning well. You know, you eat dinner and you brush your teeth and you kids get their homework done and you wake up and you, and for some families that's making your bed and keeping a house of order. Those kinds of things are important. Those structural pieces. Uh, if my but kids are he, listening, can we repeat that list one more time? <laughs> <laughs> Remember all these things, do your homework, yeah, do make your, homework, your bed, make your bed. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Pick uh, up your brush clothes, your teeth. brush yes, your okay. teeth. Yeah, you heard um, it from an expert guys. <laughs> this is important. And, and those routines are very important, but then the other side is what we call rituals and rituals are very fascinating. Rituals are those things that are, so I'll say to students, how do you say goodbye when you tell your parents goodbye on the phone? And many of them have phrases that they repeat, right? They say, um, are there any birthday traditions that are just your families and the goofy things that families do, right? Or movie quote patterns or dancing it, it around, you know, doing dishes together or and all the things, these rituals that establish identity that are so important in a healthy emotional climate. So you need these, what we call rituals of connection. And I think when we talk about family prayer, that's a ritual of connection. It can be routine, right? We know the difference, or it can serve that purpose of being a ritual of connection, family prayer and family devotional and family home evening. And they even sitting down and having dinner. Dinner is one of those that comes up 
just ubiquitously in research as having a powerful benefit to children. I, I could, I could go on for four hours about the research on family dinner. Um, there's something powerful about sitting together. You're kind of in a, in a place of commonality because everyone has to eat. And so there's like a, a reduction of hierarchy that way. There's different kinds of conversations, even linguistically, it's very powerful because you'll have narrative talk where children are telling a story about what happened and dad and mom are bringing in news or talking about professional and they're bringing in a different kind of vocabulary. You have that in, in the CASA research of the center for addiction and substance abuse, there is one predictor that comes up every single year when they collect that data as the, the thing that predicts less likelihood of substance abuse for adolescents. And it's the number of family meals in a week. So it's the number of times they have eaten dinner in that week as a family. You're sitting down together. Even if, even if it is, you're breaking open the bags of Wendy's who got the single, who got that, but, but you're sitting down together. I'm fascinated by that. The family sacrament is what one researcher would call it. And so it's a sitting down, looking at one another, hearing one another, talking to one another. And we all know it's not always a fun occasion, right? Like I think my mom with five little children, like peas all over the place, people throwing <laughs> things, right? You spilled 95 times at that meal, but there is so much power in the consistency of that ritual. And it has ritual elements where you sit who, what many of my students have a ritual where they shared their high, their low, you know, their, their rain cloud, their sun, right. The, at the, at the meal, who they served or what they learned or, and these are all ritual elements that if they don't happen, it's like when you try to put that young child to bed and you don't tell them the story that night and they cannot go to bed because that ritual has been so core to their emotional well being. You can't mix it up. If you don't, if you leave out the birthday tradition, right this one year, that child feels like I'm alienated. I don't belong. <laughs> these, these rituals are very powerful. And so when we talk about this whole idea of in the ways of God, rituals that orient us to God are so important in family life. And again, can the structure get in the way of the heart? Yes. It's why that focus on what is the heart, but God and Christ and this centerpiece of our lives, they redeem us. You know, that retaining that, even as you're like, get in here for family prayer and sit down and please be quiet and quit interrupting. And right. And we're practicing, we're practicing over and over again, that process. But, but I love that family research on uh, that helps us understand what it means to be growing up in the ways of God and, and the power that rituals can have in that, even when they're failed, right? Even if it feels like there was 15 years of failure of this family devotional ritual or this family, evening ritual, right? We tried, we were consistent. We wanted them to know we cared about them hearing about God and that we were together in that. <laughs> Somebody described a family home evening as an argument that <laughs> ends and begins with a prayer or something. <laughs> yes. I don't know when it was. There was some time um, um, along in my parenting. I think it was my wife who taught me, look, we're not just after getting the room clean. We're not just after getting a prayer said. We're not just after eating a meal. We're after building relationships. So make sure that your goals, you know, when you go into these rituals, would you say you got to have the right goal in mind? The goal is not to get just get the room clean. The goal is to build the relationship and get the room clean. You could get the room clean and destroy the relationship. I've, I've yes, done it. I'm an expert at those kind of things, actually, Hank. Yeah. I'm an, and I know all this data. And it is, that's why I think it takes compassion for ourselves in this journey. Because you, and, and that the purpose of life really is to taste the bitter, to prize the sweet. So Hank, you and I, who are like trying to get that room cleaned, and I, I have this experience where I'm over and over again, get, pick that up, right? And ruining the relationship in the process. But I'm learning from that experience of bitterness. You know what? I'm going to change that. Yeah, and I want to do that do differently. That <laughs> yeah. And I might do it 400 times wrong, right? But, but God is good and gives us this mortal experience to, to learn through bitterness, to prize the sweet. And sometimes that can, that the bitterness can cloud our view of God's love for us, but all around us, we see, right? Here is hope again. We're going again. We're going to work on this being about the relationship, this about being about intimacy and connection and knowing you and loving you in a better way. So let the milk spill. Yes. Right. 
And it's why my mom took on the motto, have a laugh. That was our family motto. When, it, when the milk spills, have a laugh. Just say it right out before we get upset, right? Like right. we're just, just going to have a laugh. There it goes. Look <laughs> there at that. it goes. Yep. <laughs> Here we go again. Here's 14 and 15. And we see this shift and hear the Lord, right? He's going to teach us about what had happened. Here he told these children, thou art my children, the direct descendants of heavenly parents. And then it says, and the children of men were numerous. And in those days, Satan had great dominion and raged in their hearts. And every man's right it, 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 hand was against his own brother and seeking for power. Here they'd lost their identity. They had rejected that identity of being from God and they're seeking for power, not God's power, not priesthood power. He promised that priesthood power, his power, but seeking another way and how deeply painful it's why in Moses seven, right? We'll see him weeping. Why is he weeping? And it's not your sins against me. He's weeping for their sins against one another and how deeply painful that is. This, to hate their own flesh. That in verse fifteen, Janet, this idea of here's here's the ideal and here's the poison, right? <laughs> the poison comes in. It's it's anger, right? Dominion. He raged in their hearts and came wars and bloodshed. Yes. Um, oh, and the seeking of power, right? And yeah, power. mankind. Yeah. I, yeah, that's so beautiful to think this ideal and then this, what happens in real mortal life. Right. And as you said, John in within one's own family, in Lehi's case, right. There was this raging and the Lord never gives up. He doesn't say, well, goodness, right? Like that's what can I do with these people have rejected and now they're hating one another and the pain that it causes me. So I just pull out no way. He keeps coming back, repent, turn. And if it's not in this generation, in Lehi, Lehi's case, he's bringing them back generations later, right? Bringing them back, fulfilling that covenant relationship, never quitting in, in seeking his children to follow in his path. It's hard enough to be a parent and then adding an adversary who is deliberately trying to poison your family. Oh, right. Yes. I think the Lord gets it. This is tough. <laughs> Yes. I love that. And there was, there was no other way, right? Like we have to experience that bitterness to know the sweet, to choose as the given say, to choose Christ with eyes wide open. I love that. When we experience bitterness in family life, when we experience bitterness in our own lives, and we all do, it's part of the plan. So we can choose Christ with our eyes wide open. We know the pain and we will choose differently. Hmm. I've noticed, maybe I'm being a little too vulnerable here, but uh, I've noticed when my relationships with my older children get t tense, it's usually an idea of power, so right? So much, like, yes. And honor and, and yes. <laughs> you're insulting my, my ego, Right? Yes. My pride uh, and I'm going to, I'm going to upset you in your place, right? You have, you can't talk to me that way. I'm your parent. I'm your, that feels like verse 15, Satan rages in the hearts of, of people. They're seeking for power, um, over their own family. I will never forget the first time our daughter, our Alyssa said no to me really strongly. And she kind of said no, it, uh, just a wonderful gift to me because she is an independent personality, not a pleaser. And that's been very helpful for my growth. But I will never forget that first time when I was like, I can't believe you just said that. Right. And that feeling has happened over and over again. And it is, <laughs> if I'm honest with myself, it's not, I'm not thinking about what she's communicating about her own feelings. I'm thinking about what that means for me and right. My own ego or my own insecurity being right. Kind of infecting my understanding of her. And I can't be. And that's why that beautiful healing has to happen over and over again with parents. Cause that is absolutely natural to feel that way. And if we're coming back to the base, of that pyramid, am I being truthful about what's really happening here? And that this is really about me instead of about what she's trying to communicate 
about her needs and herself and her growth and just how we, it's just a growing process to not get in the way of that experience of parenting, right? Our own selves. Do you guys remember getting hit by your own kids for the first time when they're maybe two or three (laughs) and they're mad at you and you're holding them and they just soft you upside the head and you're like, Like, you, (laughs) (laughs) yes, yes. And I can get those feelings, right? As a mother who's giving a lot, right. And trying to serve a lot, you can get into that. You owe me something, right. Mindset. And, and I think it is a power dynamic there. Okay, here's 21 again. And Jared taught Enoch in all the ways of God. There's that phrase coming up again. What does that mean to teach the ways of God? And it is that path of repentance. Then 22 and 23. I, I love this. And and John, you actually brought this up a little bit before, but here's, here's that genealogy of the sons of Adam, who was the son of God. It ne- it just wants over and over again. This is who you are. You are a child directly of God. That is so core. And then that next verse, and they were preachers of righteousness and spake and prophesied and called upon all men everywhere. And what are we going to hear again? That calling upon to repent. And it's the opposite of that shame world. It's come and grow with Christ. Come and be honest about yourself. Come and speak the truth. Remove the shame. Come and be changed. And then it says, and faith was taught unto the children of men. You can never teach repentance, right? Without the very first truth being faith. We, I, I loved uh, hearing Carrie Mulstein. You had him on that very first podcast of this year and, and that absolute assurance, I can do my work. This is my work and my glory. I can do my work. I can do that work in your life. I can do the work, that work in your children's lives on me. And you both just shared so powerfully that reliance on God. And so whenever we teach repentance, the foundation is faith in his belief in us, faith in our belief in him and what he can do in us. Please join us for part two of this podcast.